Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, social marketers around the world. My name is Christine Jennings, and it is both my privilege and pleasure to introduce the 47th in a series of webinars designed to advance social marketing teaching, research, and practice. We'll begin in just a minute, but before we do, I'd like to share brief information about the International Social Marketing Association, since we're welcoming both ISMA members and people who may be unaware of our professional association. ISMA is a federation of individuals and regional member associations. When you join ISMA, you automatically become a member of your regional association as well. So you get the benefit of international-based resources and information relevant to your region. Together, we advance behavior change for social good. Our members are change agents from all sectors behavioral scientists and researchers, psychologists, environmental educators, health communicators, academics, practitioners, and students. Anyone eager to learn new tools to change behavior will benefit from becoming a member. Your membership includes access to resources such as online training, professional journals, conference discounts, and our webinar archive of recorded webinars. If you're not already a member, please visit the ISMA website to join. ISMA offers three social marketing training options taught by leading social marketers from around the world. Students earn a professional certificate from ISMA. These are all online and range from a three session to a 12 week course. Registration for our newest training course is open now. It's a self paced short low cost course that gives you the flexibility to register and take the course at any time. If you're interested in a more in-depth planning course and the opportunity to study with Nancy Lee or want to train on research methods in social marketing, I encourage you to register your interest so you'll be the first to learn when those online courses will be available. We'll also be promoting these courses on ISMA social media. So if you're not already following, connect with us on LinkedIn or Twitter right now to know when registration opens for future courses. I'm here today with our webinar moderator, Tamara Harbour and today's speakers, Don Weissenen and Lindsay Grove. Tamara and I have worked to arrange today's webinar and we'll manage any questions you may have for our speakers at the end of the presentation. Dave Cutter is our technical host and working with us behind the scenes to help make this webinar a success. Today's webinar is being recorded and will soon be available in our archive. We have webinars throughout the year featuring speakers and issues from around the world. So we encourage you to follow us on social media so you can Stay up to date on what's coming up next. Finally, if you have questions, as I'm sure many of you will, for our speakers, please use the Q&A box. You can feel free to submit those anytime. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, just make sure you use the Q&A box, not the chat box. That'll be the best way to submit your questions today. And we'll be sure to save some time at the end for speaker questions. So now I'd like to turn the webinar over to Tamara, our moderator for today's session. Tamara? Thanks, Christine. I am so happy to introduce our two speakers today on such an important topic. Don Weissenden is a professor at the City University of New York in the Baruch College's Marx School of Public and International Affairs. He teaches courses and workshops in strategic communication, which includes social marketing, and also teaches seminars on conflict and negotiation and leadership and management. He's authored a number of books on leadership, policy, and politics. And his forthcoming book uses a social marketing framework to address problems in the US voting system. And it's titled appropriately, States of Confusion, How New Voter ID Laws Fail Democracy and What to Do About It. We have a second speaker with us today, who is Dr. Lindsay Grove, and she is a public health practitioner working at the University of South Florida's St. Petersburg campus, where she is the program coordinator and an instructor for health sciences. 
Lindsay is also the co-owner of Carriage House Consulting, which is a nonprofit support consulting firm in St. Petersburg, Florida, and the president of the League of Women Voters of the St. Petersburg area. And her interests lie in public health policy and the intersection of community health and civic engagement. So we are very fortunate to have both Don and Lindsay with us today um, to talk about how social marketing can play a unique role in strengthening the demic product processes in the face of increasing partisanship and disillusionment with institutions. Today, we'll hear them sharing specific real world examples where social marketing has been used to change voter behaviors in low voter turnout populations. And we'll also be hearing key recommendations for social marketers to keep in mind in their work. I'm sure everyone is eager to hear what you have to share with us on this important topic. So let's get started. Don is our first speaker. So Don, over to you. Thanks so much, Tamara. Let me just pull this up here for a moment and welcome everybody. Uh, good to have you here and a uh, delight to share this with you today. So this is States of Confusion, uh, how social marketing can help people get what they need to vote. And to get us into this for a moment, uh, at least here in the United States, you may have noticed this is a, a big topic in the news cycle the past year or so, but I wanna start by having you imagine for a moment that you're a citizen who's never had problems casting your vote in an election. So you see it as your duty to show up at the voting booth each election day. And, and like most people, regardless of your party or your candidate preferences, you believe every citizen deserves the right to vote. However, with a recent change in employment, uh, you've just moved states for a new job and there's a national election around the corner next month, you hop online to find your local county election office some 30 miles away, and you realize it's only open during Tuesday, uh, from Tuesdays to Fridays each week. So you're going to need, need to ask your new boss with some trepidation to have let you have some time off to go register to vote. You head out and uh, you arrive at the office equipped with an ID that always worked for election purposes in your last state. So you stand in this long line for an hour and pull out your ID for the clerk who says they will only accept photo, state photo IDs and you're going to have to go to the Transportation Commission some 40 miles away in the other direction to get that. Um, although some documents you possess like uh, present you with no difficulties like you have a previous state's driver's license. Uh, last year, your birth certificate was destroyed in a small basement flood, uh, and you learned that getting a duplicate certificate is $33, uh, and that an item like a utility bill, which you might need to present, needs to be notarized, but the clerk of the elections office can't remember. Um, making little income from your new job as it is, and your kids need picked up from daycare, you decide to sit it out this election cycle, don't want to drive all that distance, uh, exhausted and confused. And that's it, no, no voting in this election. Now, while this may seem like an extreme case, let me introduce you for a moment to Anthony Settles, uh, a retired engineer in Texas who had an expired ID card, a social security card, and a past student ID from his time as a student at the University of Houston. Uh, it, given Texas's updated voter ID law though, which required a name matching his birth certificate, off he went to try to find documentation to get registered to vote and found out when he was 14 years old, his mother changed his last name after marrying. And this led to a whole wild goose chase of him having to enlist lawyers to go to DC courthouses uh, in a process that initially cost him $250. And at the end of this, he said, it was a bureaucratic nightmare. I feel like I'm not wanted in this state. So for those of you uh, in uh, both in the United States and in other countries, I wanna share that in the United States in particular, we have a lot of election related behaviors that are ripe for social marketing interventions. The first and the, the biggest barrier of all is voting itself, getting people out to vote. But in the, in the US prior to that, we also have registration for voting, which is an opt in rather than opt out system in most places. And on top of that, and I won't get into too many details here, but years ago in 2013, our United States Supreme Court passed a law 
that uh, states could basically do whatever they want with voting. Uh, there's a whole thing behind this. The states used to have to go to the federal government to pre-clear requirements for this, but now states have all these different requirements for voting. There's very little uniformity. And now citizens find themselves with this third behavioral challenge, which is gathering all sorts of very selectively targeted uh, forms of documentation required to vote. So just to show you here, this is from the Brennan Center at NYU. This is 2004 and before states, for instance, with strict photo ID laws for voting, you must have certain kinds of ID. Uh, this is what the map looked like. Uh, moving forward, 2016 election, strict photo ID laws, legislators start to put into effect all over the place. And uh, particularly in what we captured in the study you're gonna see here were the 10 strictest voter ID states. Now, a lot of this is premised upon voter fraud, uh, the idea that there's all kinds of rampant voter fraud across the United States. I'm gonna skip this for a moment. There's not, I put a trademark beside it because this has become kind of an industry in the United States, making claims uh, to underpin public policies being formed through there's voter fraud occurring. I can get into that in Q&A if you'd like, but that's basically the impetus behind this. And now, uh, post 2020 election in this unprecedented year, now we have 19 states enacting 33 laws, really making it harder and harder for people to vote, putting in more requirements, stricter requirements, reducing the number of IDs that can be accepted for pre-registration for voting. And just so you know, uh, this is the snapshot that I think might makes sense to most people. In Texas, for instance, you can vote with a gun permit, but not a student ID. So I'll say it, I'll say it loudly and clearly, these are highly racialized and politicized policies that have been created uh, largely, whether consciously or not from legislators to disenfranchise certain populations. That's at least the effect of this stuff. So uh, along came a group and I to say, I think a social marketing intervention might help with some of this stuff that's going on in the US. And just so you know, um, according to Vote Riders and Gilda Daniels and Uncounted, about 11% of people in the United States, more than 25 million in total, are negatively affected by voter documentation requirements. And these are mostly in the swing states that tend to decide presidential elections. So it's no small matter thinking about how do we help people get what they need to vote. So some of our social marketing related questions for a study that uh, my colleagues and I put together, how do nonprofits and community organizations currently assist potential voters with these requirements? What do citizens in strict voter ID states know about these documentation requirements? Just basic knowledge questions. Uh, what are the key incentives and barriers for voted, voters related to this first stage of gathering documentation to get registered to vote? And then finally, we wanted to look out and see what are the bright spots out there? What are the most effective interventions, promotional methods, and places for nonprofits and community organizations to reach potential voters who have documentation challenges? We hypothesize that nonprofits are in every state in the United States. They are some of the institutions closest to people, uh, the populations who might be most affected by these policies, and therefore they would be a great source of knowledge and also points of intervention for kind of midstream social marketing work to make a difference. In our study, we used a six-part research design. Won't go too far into this, just show you. We, we cast a wide net on this issue to form a base of insights for social marketing. Uh, we did an online survey of nonprofits in the uh, 10 strictest voter ID states in-depth literature reviews. Uh, this is where it got interesting, and this is a snapshot I'll show you in a moment. We did an audit of county voter registration offices. We got a team together to act like regular citizens calling uh, county election offices to find out what might be needed to vote. Some of these things uh, that were mentioned earlier in terms of documentation. We did an online survey of community members in the 10 strictest voter ID states focus groups with participants in Ohio and Mississippi that was highly illuminating. I'll show you some of those re results in a moment. And a snowball sample of interviews with experts, practitioners, and nonprofit staff across these states. If there's any story here, it's that many previously registered to vote or eligible citizens have to navigate a confusing morass of barriers to get what they need to vote. And as soon as we started seeing this again, my social marketing radar went off and said, who is it out there that knows how to deal with barriers the best? Uh, often it's not politicians, it's not awareness campaigns, it's, it's social marketing efforts and things like that. 
Um, but there are many bright spots locally and nationally. Uh, so we saw a need to embed and scale contextually sensitive social marketing approaches in strict voter ID states, which can help people fulfill one of their most basic rights. Um, as part of this study and its recommendations, we do have a whole part that's about what can be done at a policy level. I'd be happy to get into that, but um, a little bit of fatalist in me coming out here, um, until legislators can get their acts together and there can be uniform and standardized national changes to our voting system, I see social marketing as the next step down where we go, let's do everything we can until that happens through social marketing efforts. So it really helps us get to what's needed now. Just to give you a little bit of uh, insight as to what we found in this study, I can't get to everything here, but uh, how often voter documentation is a problem for nonprofit service recipients. We found, by and large, most people in the nonprofits we talked to knew people for whom these were problems often or occasionally. And then just jumping forward here, we were interested to know what are you doing that's working for people? How are you helping people get what they need to vote as we come up with this larger book and plan for social marketing to make a difference here? Um, helping people stay on top of changing requirements was one thing. Uh, connecting them with online assistance, assistance and other groups like Spread the Vote and organizations called Vote Writers that help people with voter ID challenges. Um, and then lastly, lots of interesting things around working in coalitions, arranging cab rides for constituents that nonprofits serve to go to the DMV or sometimes even going so far as contacting a local political representative in really difficult cases with lots of nuances, a little bit like the one I showed you earlier with Anthony Settles. So uh, let me give you a little bit of a insight into one of the other processes we did, which was calling election offices uh, doing this audit. So we had a team uh, calling around uh, 15 of the offices in the least populous, 15 of the offices in the most populous across these state uh, regions, across these states. Uh, we had kind of a uniform standard. We applied with it. And each of our researchers called in and said, hi, I'm calling to find out what's needed to vote in the next election. About 80 election offices mentioned voter ID unprompted, while 58 failed to mention voter ID or documentation that's needed. And we see, received no information at all from 12 due to calls going to voicemail or for other reasons. What we're really trying to do here is find out really honestly, brutal in a brutally realistic way, what is it like for a citizen to navigate the current system? Forget the idealistic way of doing this. I want to find out what is it like? What are the barriers they actually come into? And so right off the bat here, we could see this was some significant challenges potentially arising for people, particularly because we knew what to ask about. Uh, for those who didn't, uh, we can see people very easily giving up along any, any line of this process. Uh, on a more hopeful note, about 56 out of the 58 who failed to mention voter ID talked about it when prompted. But when we got into the details, it got a little more difficult. Um, 83 of them provided specific forms of documentation, while 53 didn't, and the remaining 14 gave us neither answer. Sometimes people just didn't even know uh, what was going on. So some of the things we found, stark differences between jurisdictions' websites that could be hard for people to navigate. Frequently, only one form of ID would be cited. Most often, it was a driver's license when there were others. And by the way, one of the paradoxes, the ironies around all of this is there really isn't any ID in the United States that was created for voting to begin with. So we're being asked to assemble all these things that in their origins had nothing to do with voting, but you need to use those for voting. So there's a grand irony built into the system with this. Um, patience and perseverance were required. Sometimes we were on hold for up to 10 minutes. Uh, sometimes election office staff couldn't answer basic questions, or they said, well, the person who really knows about ID or documentation needed is out today. Can you call back tomorrow? We can see somebody giving up at that point. Uh, sometimes there was conflicting information we found. When we called offices in North Dakota, there were differences in how long one needed to be a resident of a state uh, in two counties, for instance. Um, so what this led us to was, my goodness, uh, this is, there's states of confusion, the title of our forthcoming book. It's really hard. It's really confusing for people navigating our voting system. Uh, the states are doing what they will uh, in very different ways. So what's really needed is to standardize the ex these experiences to create equal opportunities to understand and practice all processes related to voting. I wanna share with you a couple more things. We went to Ohio and Mississippi to do focus groups uh, 
with different populations there uh, served by nonprofits. Give you uh, one example of what a focus group participant told us in Ohio uh, is college students. And college students don't always have their birth certificates on them, something they have at their parents' home. Not everyone has their driver's license, so there should be more options. Going to the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles here in the US is time consuming and there's a cost like $22. I don't have that to spare. It feels like no one cares about me or cares what I have to say because I can't get there. I pay taxes and everything yet can't be heard like everyone else. I feel like that's why people think their votes don't matter because it takes so much effort and it's such a hassle and not everyone can handle to get it done. For places where it's harder for some people, they should have accommodations for everybody. So just some of the additional barriers we heard across groups, different registration deadlines in states were confusing, variations in state and county laws and requirements actually were more challenging than federal rules around voting. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we found was what we called a circular trap where someone would need a, a state photo ID and notarization to get a birth certificate, right? But they didn't have that. And that was the very thing they were trying to get. So people found themselves in little loops where the very thing they needed to get to vote uh, required the, the actual documentation to vote and they were caught in a loop and they couldn't get either. Um, this happened in Pennsylvania, for instance, with certain populations when these laws were passed. Uh, people move a lot, right? People genuinely surprised that when you move from Illinois to Wisconsin, that your Illinois driver's license could not be used for the purposes of voting. Uh, for anybody interested, by the way, this is why Ted Cruz and Chris Kobach and company are wrong. Uh, they say you need a, you need an ID for getting drugs at the uh, prescription drugs, or you need it for getting on a plane. You're right, but your, your ID in Illinois works for that if you're in Wisconsin. In voting, it's gotten very selective, um, and that's exactly what we're honing in on here is helping people through, through, through those loops. Um, transportation and time, lost records, particularly among the elder, elderly, printing and literacy challenges, and sometimes misperceptions. People, uh, just perceptions of if you, uh, you'll be called for jury duty if you sign up to vote was one of them. Um, and a lot around uh, previously, uh, the, those who had been in jail previously, we had some interesting results with those kinds of things as well. Be happy to get into. One more here just to show you, again, the complexity of challenges. This was from an elections official in Arizona, been in the news a lot this year. I was at an event yesterday working with people who have some sort of disability. They're living in this complex so they can get full-time assistance and not all of them have a driver's license or state ID. They don't drive. The complex didn't have a birth certificate on file for everyone who was there. So this became a hurdle for those people who wanted to register to vote there. They're eligible to register to vote, but don't have that proof of citizenship documentation with them and would have a difficulties getting them from an appropriate agency. It's a problem. All right, so uh, last couple things here. Snapshot of potential solutions and ways forward. Um, things we found, bright spots where social marketing could really make a difference, things that are already happening in communities, but could be embedded and scaled at a larger level. Um, just letting people use nonprofit resources, right? A lot of state election systems, unfortunately, still rely on paper. You got to print this form out. You got to sign it, right? In an age where we've got electronic signatures and things, a lot of our election systems have not caught up to that. So as much as you can help people with printing, the use of computers to get registered to vote, um, connecting the election with things in people's personal lives we found was a really important messaging component to develop out. Um, working with county clerks or local government offices to send a mobile ID unit to people's homes. Many of you are probably familiar in social marketing with the, the mobile dental clinic on wheels, famous example. I think we need a mobile unit for helping people with voting, particularly in, in rural areas. Here, here's someone comes along, it's just basically get them set up and registered to vote and they can go vote and do what they will of their own accord from there. Working with trusted nonprofits like legal clinics, helping with translations for uh, uh, multiple languages uh, and helping de uh, deal with fears about voting. We found a lot of this in Georgia, for instance, and other places uh, among immigrant communities uh, who are really looking for who can I trust, who will help me, right? And uh, it has to be very localized at that level to maintain tr and sustain trust. Piggybacking off of non-voting related ID challenges is a social marketing solution as well. So when people are signing up for Medicare enrollment, that could be the perfect place for helping them also get registered to vote, deal with documentation challenges. 
And this is one of the biggest solutions we think in terms of social marketing is having one person uh, really help one other person who needs that help along the way. And this is a model that we found developed by a group called Spread the Vote, where they have volunteers sign up to take one person through whatever is needed, rides to offices, help with expenses for procuring documentation. It's a very individual tailored approach, but has been very successful with this one group. We'd love to see that scaled as well. And just using forms like social media, to build trust with communities. We heard a lot of groups, uh, for instance, like the immigrant groups in Georgia say that having a WhatsApp group, something like that, communicating uh, in, in those kinds of ways was trusted. If it was a cluster of nonprofits that they worked with for social services, um, they would support that kind of thing as well. There's lots more. We built out a whole book on this. And so in, in conclusion here, I just wanna say for everybody listening, whether you're in the US or abroad, this is the one issue that affects all the other issues that we care about. And if every one of us puts some of our attention and skills toward elections and voting, I think we'd make a lot of progress on all the other fronts. I'm happy to speak about the policy changes I should think that should happen. And in the United States, we've got a lot undergo uh, with that, with the John Lewis Voting Act, for instance, and such. But until that time, until there can be major policy changes, I think social marketers and social marketing approaches can offer some of the best solutions possible. I wanted to also flag that out in 2022, uh, we have an my co-authors and I, Sonia Jarvis and Nicole Gordon, we have an entire book we've constructed around this using a social marketing approach called States of Confusion, How no New Voter ID Laws Fail Democracy and What to Do About It. Uh, that will be out with NYU Press in 2022. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Lindsay, anytime you're ready to go. We've got our second speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, thank, uh, Don, what a great presentation. You're a hard act to follow. Um, but I think that this ties in really well with um, what uh, Don was talking about. So. Again, my name is Dr. Lindsay Grove. Um, I am with the University of South Florida um, in, on the St. Petersburg campus. And um, I'm actually gonna talk about um, applying uh, behavior change marketing to a local community in the 2020 election. And this campaign was called the Democracy Starts at Home campaign. So we're gonna talk about the campaign strategy, um, how we as, as the League of Women Voters of the St. Petersburg area use data and information, um, as well as applied some of the um, uh, behavior change marketing principles uh, to create this amazing campaign, um, and then how we use this to influence voter behavior. And before I get started, I really just want to um, give a little bit of background. Um, the, if you're not familiar, in the United States, um, there is a national organization called the League of Women Voters, which was uh, started right after the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920 that gave women the right to vote. Um, obviously, in the 1920s, this was mostly white women, uh, but the League was born out of the suffragist movement, and we have been working to empower voters and defend democracy for the past 101 years. And I came to our local League here in St. Petersburg in 2017 and just fell in love with the organization. The St. Petersburg local chapter is one of the largest local chapters in the United States. Florida um, in and of itself has about 10% of uh, League of Women Voters membership. Uh, so we're, we're a pretty active state when it comes to uh, the League. But as Don mentioned, we are also a state that faces a lot of voter suppression laws, especially in the last couple of years. Um, and so it's been really, really important as a state and as local chapters here in the state of Florida that we work strategically to influence voter behavior so that democracy can flourish here. So 
I will say it's been really interesting. Uh, I, you know, I'm a public health practitioner. I uh, got a social marketing certificate at the University of South Florida during my uh, doctoral program. And I, for some reason, never considered um, how it could be used here locally uh, in, in voter behavior until the 2020 election. Um, we ended up having some funding left over from a grant because of COVID, and we decided to really try and focus on low voter turnout areas here in, in uh, the municipal bounds of, of the city of St. Petersburg. Um, so when we started looking at voter precinct data, what we found was that there's actually a cluster of precincts with some of the lowest voter turnout numbers in the county. And so we decided to take a look at those precincts. Um, we actually ended up moving our office uh, to be at geographically located in those precincts because we recognized that this was the community that needed um, our help the most. So as we started looking at that data and we started looking at you know, census information about uh, the folks that lived in those precincts, we started looking at young people, people of color, we looked at voters with disabilities, we started looking at, you know, what the transportation barriers were. Uh, the state of Florida has a great vote by mail uh, system here, but that doesn't mean that everybody uses it. And so um, we started looking at a bunch of different um, audiences. And one of the things that also impacted this was COVID-19. Um, we wanted to make sure that not only were people voting, but also that they were voting safely. And so the vote by mail piece became really, really, really important as we were considering our campaign. So again, we looked at voter turnout precinct data. We actually had also recently conducted a civic engagement study in the city of St. Pete. We had a sample size of 1,500, which uh, you know met the sample size uh, uh, to, to, to check for st um, statistic uh, significance. And we had a lot of really great data that helped inform our campaign as well, as well as where, where we wanted to focus our efforts. One of the biggest things that came out of this civic engagement study, and it is available on our website if you'd like to take a look at it, uh, was that St. Pete is an extremely engaged city no matter what your demographic, um, you know, who you are, what you look like, where you live, but where you decide to put your efforts is very different depending on your race and ethnicity as well as your income. Um, you know, we saw a lot of, you know, more affluent communities, um, uh, communities that were whiter. They typically were the ones that were calling city council, you know, um, they were the ones that were getting really, really involved in the city and county political process. However, if you were in more lower income and, and you know, some of our um, communities of color, you've likely come up against a lot of barriers to engaging in the political process. And so a lot of times what we were hearing both in the survey as well as in our focus groups that we did, was that folks were more interested in focusing on the community. So volunteering at their school, at their churches. So there was a lot of, you know, turning inward. And so we use that as well to sort of think about how we were going to make decisions about the, the uh, path of the, of the campaign itself. So just to reiterate, so this was showing, um, again, you know, you have these, uh, this cluster of precincts here in South St. Pete, which had very low voter turnout. There was obviously some other areas, but you know, we have finite resources. And so we decided to focus in that area. We also looked at census data as well. And then we leveraged our partnerships in the community to look at assets. What were some places in the community that we knew were organic social networks that we could, you know, begin, you know, asking people questions to help inform the campaign itself. And then of course, using those um, as a part of the marketing mix when we you know, implemented the campaign itself. And so we did asset mapping um, once we determined the geographic area and who exactly we were going to, um, to do outreach to. So here were some of our considerations for our audience. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to people and, and, and you know, focusing on folks that were the most negatively impact um, by the health issue. In this case, we were looking at COVID, but we were also looking at, you know, barriers to political participation. We wanted to make sure that people 
um, were increasing their voting. That was the behavior change we wanted to focus on. Um, initially, people wanted to focus on registering people to vote, but what we found, what we have found in the past, you know, in the years that we've been doing voter registration as an organization is that, you know, it's great to get people to register to vote, but that, that behavior should not end there. We really want to, you know, get people to the ballots or, you know, get people um, casting their ballots as well as, you know, making sure that people are informed at the ballot box. So we decided that we wanted to increase voting. And so we decided, okay, we're gonna then focus on registered voters. Um, we also wanted to make sure that folks were safe um, while increasing voting. And we felt like this was very feasible, especially after talking with our partners in the community. Um, so overall, we decided that we were going to focus specifically on black registered voters. We decided that we were actually going to focus on women because women had typically higher um, voter turnout compared to men. And um, again, we specifically focused on the uh, precincts that had the lowest voter turnout. So again, really trying to break it down. We didn't necessarily completely focus on income because we knew that you know, as, as long as we made sure that they were registered folks, that they were, um, they were women, as well as they were in those precincts, that was important. We also decided to focus on parental status. So we were looking at, you know, the family structures that were most common in those precincts. Um, we had a lot of very um, matriarch uh, focused families. And so we wanted to make, and that's part of the other reason that we decided to also focus on women. So now that we had determined what our product and our audience was, we came up with our position statement and um, we started the Democracy Starts at Home campaign. And this was really based on conversations that we had had with our partners. So we were looking at um, they, what our partners had started telling us was, listen, I vote because it's a family tradition. It's important to my community. When I go to the polling station, it's usually a church in my community and it's a place for me to be social and catch up with people. So we really wanted to focus heavily on making voting a tradition. And so that really helped inform our, you know, the, the, uh, how we promoted it and, and who we decided that we wanted to partner with. Um, and this is just an example. I, I've done this um, presentation for other league chapters in the state because I would love to see this replicated um, in other places. But you know, we you know made sure we were texting people, um, going to community events when safe, and making sure that people were signed up for vote by mail. Um, even though vote by mail is is really really popular here, there was a lot of confusion around. Um, how to sign up for vote by mail. A lot of people didn't realize that you had to continually let the supervisor of elections know that they that you had to um, that you wanted to continue to vote by mail. Um, we also understood that you know there's a price. Um, it takes time to request a vote by mail ballot. You also have to remember to put it in the mail by a certain time. So that's why we highly utilized um, a texting campaign as well as you know making sure that we were. Uh, working with churches in the community to remind people. We put on um, and partnered with folks in the community to put on events like Rolls to the Polls, which was all about getting people out in their cars and going to a drop box that was uh, located at a really popular site, uh, Tropicana Field. Um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, not only were you casting your ballot, but we had kids ballots. So we had ballots that parents could fill out with their kids to start that tradition of voting together and, and um, making it so that it was something that parents and kids could do together to really start that habit. And then again, you know, we actually um, commissioned a couple of murals in, um, in South St. Pete and downtown that, that uh, promoted voting by mail. They were done by artists of color and they were very focused on diversity and the importance of voting in our communities. Uh, we did a ton of social media outreach. We actually commissioned um, a photography project that, that um, featured people in the community voting together, looking at the voter guide. Um, 
So we really tried to make it as local as possible and make it feel as authentic. And, you know, just like, well, my aunt's voting, so I'm going to vote. Um, our partnerships were incredibly important for us. You know, we knew that, you know, we recognize that here in St. Petersburg, the League of Women Voters is a majority white organization, and we were focusing on, you know, women of color. So we wanted to make sure that our partners um, were, you know, first and foremost, the ones that are, you know, um, putting out an authentic message. And we're also listening to them and trying to work, you know, side by side to ensure that there's equal power shared in this campaign. Um, and they were extremely instrumental in helping us do the formative research um, and having those conversations about what messages make sense, you know, what kind of, you know, graphics should we use? You know, they were instrumental in helping us do that. Um, of course, place was really important. COVID significantly reduced our, you know, our ability to do outreach, you know, in person. So we really had to rely on partners to get information out on their social media networks um, in their places where they were meeting people. Um, and we just really wanted to make sure that it was easier for people to actually perform, you know, the task itself of voting. So fortunately, our supervisor of elections here in Pinellas actually paid for postage, uh, which was huge because postage, even though it might not seem like a big barrier, not everybody has access to stamps, you know, or to be able to get stamps. And it, it is an actual financial cost. So we wanted to also make sure people knew that you don't need a stamp in order to return your mail-in ballot. You can obviously, you know, there's, you can drop it off at a drop box. You can, you know, take it to your polling site if you want to vote in person. And of course you can drop it off at the supervisor of elections office on the day of. So we were really trying to make sure, hey, as long as you've got your mail-in ballot, you have a multitude of choices for getting your ballot in and making your voice heard. And we of course utilized as many different community resources as possible. Uh, we partnered with our rec centers, which are all across the um, across the city, to use their um, their uh, boards outside that they post events on. For a full month, we had voting information on every single rec center sign, so that people knew exactly how they could request their ballot and where they could get information about voting. So again, partnerships were huge in this particular campaign. And I think most of us know that partnerships are just extremely important when you're doing this kind of community work. So this was the plan itself. Um, and I will say, you know, going through the process of developing a social marketing campaign was really instructive for both our volunteers. Our, our league is 100% volunteer run. So you can imagine, you know, uh, trying to implement a, a project like this with just volunteers, no paid staff. Uh, is has unique challenges, but also prevents or it also provides a lot of unique opportunities. Um, so I will say going through, you know, uh, the step by step process of developing the campaign, you know, was it, for a lot of our volunteers seemed kind of crazy. But at the end of the plan, they were like, wow, we should do this more often. This is a really great framework. Um, so, you know, again, just thinking about the target behavior you know, knowing who our specific audience is. Um, and of course, now we have all these great partners because we've done this campaign and all of the partnerships that we had developed before because of voter registration and all the issues that we work on, we could leverage that. We had ways to measure our objectives. Um, and then we had a bunch of really great activities that we could implement that were based on the formative research um, and the plan itself. And, you know, it is, we had a sustainability plan too. I mean, obviously we were very fortunate to have some funding to be able to put this together, but now we have something that we can go to other funders with. And also we have an entire community that's used to this particular branding and in the campaign itself. So it was a really great experience. I'm hoping that other leagues will wanna, um, you know, definitely implement it uh, in their own backyards. So again, just to give you an overview, you know, this is an example. This was the campaign plan in a nutshell. Um, we also um, were really just trying to increase voter turnout in the seven low voter turnout precincts by one percent. 
Um, obviously, that's really hard to, re you know, to link back to the work that we were doing, but we did see at least a 1% increase when we looked at the general election uh, voter turnout for 2020. This, of course, could be because it was a historic election. You know, the league wasn't the only organization out there doing uh, voter outreach. I mean, 2020, it's like everybody came out of the woodwork and wanted to make sure that people were voting. Um, but, you know, it also helped us make connections with other people um, who were doing this kind of work. And, you know, there was a lot of momentum leading up to uh, to the general election. So. Um, so this is, again, our campaign plan in a nutshell. Um, and just sort of to, you know, wrap up, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to use social marketing in communities. Um, you know, to, to Don's presentation and to Don's point, you know, we cannot wait around for uh, policymakers to do what they need to do to ensure that voting is, that access to the ballot is unfettered and um, is, you know, doesn't have the barriers that we're seeing increase, it seems like every single legislative session. And so, you know, I think that this is a case study, um, you know, to look at the League of Women Voters as a organization that could implement similar campaigns and at least use the social marketing framework to do better, more targeted um, community work. Um, you know, the league again has a national state and local chapters all across the United States. Um, we have um, a lot of credibility because we are a hundred plus year organization and we have limited resources. So we have to think about better ways of uting, utilizing data so that we can really focus our finite resources on, on the things that are gonna move the needle a little bit more. And each local league has great local knowledge that can be translated into you know, putting together a social marketing campaign. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities out there um, and the league isn't the only you know, organization that certainly could implement um, a social marketing campaign, you know, there's, you know, the NAACP would be a great organization and there could even be, you know, larger coalitions of folks that look at social marketing campaigns, you know, from a, from a micro to a macro lens. So I, I'm, I'm really here to sort of just give you an example of something that was done right and I think done really well um, at a local level that is really meant to uh, influence voter behavior. And we're really looking forward. We just got done with our municipal elections here. And we're, you know, definitely going to take our lessons learned from 2020 and apply them to the midterms next year. So, um, but that's my presentation. This picture actually is a picture of our mural on one of the rec centers in South St. Pete done by um, an artist called Ibombs. And he, he's a local uh, artist that lives in the area. And um, we, he, this was one of two murals that was commissioned as a part of, um, Democracy Starts at Home. So, all right, well, that's my presentation. If you have any questions, that's my email and my phone number. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lindsay and Dawn, both of you. And just a quick question, um, Karen Ginsburg um, asked for clarification for you, Lindsay, before we go further. What's SOE as a partner? That's yeah. a great question. Um, so the SOE is the supervisor of elections. So every single county in the state of Florida has a supervisor of elections. So that's the person who is elected to oversee all the elections of each county. Um, and then of course, they, they answer to the secretary of state here in the state of Florida. Okay, thank you. I, th I think that helps to have that clarity as, sure. as, as you were talking about it so that you can figure that out. Okay, um, well, there's a question here for, I'm not 100% who, sure who it's for, but it's got four votes. It says, while you're covering how to get people out and about in the US, do you have any advice for other countries, in this case, the UK, where the current government are trying to introduce what appear to be clearly intentionally difficult voter ID rules under the guise of widespread electoral fraud, despite having only had a handful of recorded incidents of this in any elections? Do we need to be ramping up efforts preemptively, or does it have to wait until we know what field we're playing on as they roll these rules?
rules out. I don't know who asked that. It's an anonymous attendee, but um, Don, maybe you, if you wanted to start with that. Sure. And by the way, part of our solutions is looking to what other countries are doing, uh, European, just all over the place where we're looking you know, a lot of countries, people are inducted into their voting system upon birth and they make it super easy and accessible. So uh, part of the model that we're hoping to develop out at the end of our book is about that. But let me just speak to this voter fraud thing because it's spreading like wildfire. Um, I, I would love for there to be social marketing work that preemptively addresses this. I wouldn't be the first person to say this, but this is the crux of the issue. It's a solution in search of a problem. And we need to call it out at every level. What you often get, here's an isolated video of like supposed fraud happening. Uh, here is a, you know, another random anecdote uh, of, this, of this occurring. And at every level, it would be so hard, I'd actually argue impossible to pull off voter fraud at the level that its proponents assert. We really need to call it out. We need to change the narrative. That's a really big thing too. I actually feel some hesitation to even use the words fraud because just using that word repetition, I think in people's minds comes, oh, that's a real thing. You know, it's that, that whole don't think of an elephant thing. Um, so I think we need to find some other terms. Uh, I go with voter suppression at every opportunity. Anytime I hear about fraud, I switch the conversation to the way that people are excluded through voting laws, um, while also legitimately going, I mean, we have to shift the burden to others on this one. Don't try to, I don't think it's a debate thing. I think it's a, what evidence do you have of that? Tell me, oh, is that the best you have, right? <laughs> That's it. It's some local thing that happened 10 years ago. Um, and it's, it's just, this is something we're going to see uh, occur over and over again. The Heritage Foundation in the U.S. here put together this guide to voter fraud, and it was over 20 years, like every single isolated case, um, many of them uns unsubstantiated, uh, put together to make it seem like, oh, there's, this has been happening a lot over 20 years, but it's the, re it's the foundation that we're fighting against in so much of this work. Um, and again, I, 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 I try to tell stories about Okay, you know, you think it's just like hopping on an airplane with an ID. This is not like that. These voter ID laws are different. They're exclusionary. They're very specific in a way that excludes. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is from Lanny Steffens, and she's addressing it to you, Don, but I, I think Lindsay might have some thoughts on this as well. Um, Lanny says, this is a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Could you speak specifically about a particular group, initiative, or a bright spot and break down, and obviously very quickly, their work in terms of social, the social marketing components, an example, the four Ps? And I think Lindsay gave us an example of that, but this is addressed to you, Don. So do you have any examples of that? Sure. And I just want to say in advance, look to Lindsay's. I am inspired by Lindsay's work and her team's work because they're really on the effects side of things, on the implementation. And I just, I see her whole project as one giant bright spot uh, for, for how to do this really well. I just love learning about her work. Um, let me tell you about the, the most shocking, surprising moment of this project for us with a group. It was in focus groups in Mississippi. Uh, and the population that we were working with was trans Mississippians who informed us that about two thirds of uh, trans population in Mississippi don't have an ID. And it has to do with the difficulties and the costs and all these barriers of name and identity marker changes to do so in a state like that versus a state like somebody else was saying in Massachusetts it was really easy for me, very hard here. And that, that, that little anecdote for me proved the point of, you know, I just don't see a uniform policy coming along anytime soon to deal with this, but a social marketer could work with that really well, right? They could figure out for this particular group of people uh, how, to trans, how, to, how to get them through this process of getting an ID of, in a state system that was not designed with their needs or interests in mind. And while, um, you know, so some of that could come down to in terms of products, just to Lonnie's question, again, I think uh, a nonprofit that has the facilities, the tech equipment, the paper printing capabilities to make that happen uh, in the hands of a person really looking to help those folks, you could have a like institutional products at hand to help with that. Um, in terms of price, 
spread the vote and vote writers does this as well that's another nonprofit they pay for people's uh, any, anything related to paying for documentation that you need to get registered, they pay for it. They raise funds around that. Is that an ideal model? I don't think so. I think the federal government needs to fund every board of election in the United States and give them the resources they need to do this well. But absent that situation, that scenario, um, we've got to work in smart ways. And I think um, you know, that's a one price consideration. Place things can be just, you know, where are the populations online, uh, trusted spaces there, the mobile voting things for really rural populations, mobile voting, uh, you know, vans that could go out and help with this. I think that's one way forward. Um, and I, one other thing I'll just mention, we saw a lot of like birth certificate clinics taking place at some very enterprising nonprofits where they would say once a month, we have a scheduled day, an hour where we, we've set aside to help our clients, our constituents, get what they need to vote, whatever that is. And for most, it's getting things like birth certificates, which are costly and right. So um, we saw these as the, you know, the social marketing interventions are already happening out there. It's just a matter of how do we systematize that and, and get other nonprofits doing this in these strict voter ID states. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, and yes, nice to hear Lindsay's work is a bright spot and it was a bright spot in our, our webinar presentation today for sure. Um, I will send these next two questions to Lindsay. Um, have you ever, because uh, Lindsay, you were talking about the, the four Ps and working with partners and, and in the community, have you ever encountered any tensions between partners and how did you deal with it? And I will also roll that into the next question just to make sure we get it in. Um, Lanny is asking again, I'm to you, Lindsay, I'm curious to hear how moving your headquarters to these those precincts impacted your work. And could you speak to that briefly? So it's about um, encountering tensions between partners, how you dealt with that and how location uh, impacted your work. So Lindsay. Great questions. Um, I think, you know, anybody that's done community work has certainly encountered uh, tension between community partners. Um, you know, one thing, uh, you know, the league, obviously, do, what we're known for is voting, it's in our name, but we also do a lot of, um, we do a lot of other issue advocacy. And so, you know, we work on immigration and gun safety and reproductive rights. And so it was really interesting, um, you know, in putting to, you know, pulling together all of these partners, um, around voting, which is a pretty, you know, Don mentioned in his presentation that, you know, voting impacts all of these issues. And so it's a really good way to galvanize folks. But, you know, there is tension even between um, like what the league does, especially around abortion rights and some of our faith partners. And so we kind of had to really navigate that. Um, and fortunately, I think that we've found ways to have, um, you know, conversations about that and they're still ongoing because obviously this is an ongoing issue, especially now with the, you know, the current political, um, the, the political landscape around abortion rights here in the States. Um, so we're continuing to try and, you know, find common ground, but also just, you know, remember to focus on, you know, we're focusing, you know, on voting rights, but we still definitely want to honor and make sure that you know our, that we are being respectful of our partners, you know, in other ways, especially if they're working on other issues. Um, to Lonnie's question, um, it has been transformative. It, I don't think we really understood how big of a signal that was to the community that the league was willing to move its office from a downtown office location to a community center. Um, in the heart of all those seven precincts. But, you know, we heard from many of our partners saying, wow, I'm, I'm impressed that you all have decided to move down here. That's not to say that there wasn't, um, you know, some of our membership was like, well, why are we moving the office? Um, but, you know, I think it was a signal to the community that we were very serious in our, um, desire to work with the community and that we really truly do care about voter voter turnout and just empowering people in the community to to be a part of the political system. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it was probably one of the smartest things we've done, um, even though it was just moving our office. So yeah. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry to say we're running out of time. And for anyone who didn't get their questions answered today, um, thank you for posting your questions. Um, you can contact Dawn and Lindsay. Their contact information is there on the slide. Um, I've also posted links in the chat box for more information on their work. Um, they are available to you to answer your questions after the webinar. You can just contact them directly yourselves. So thank you to you both. I found this absolutely fascinating to hear about everything from the barriers, uh, like systemic barriers to voting to not being able to get postage to mail something in. I mean, that is such a wide range. And then to hear the techniques of, of social marketing being applied to this, everything from a buddy system to how the four Ps apply to voting. Uh, I think this was a really, really interesting topic. And thank you for doing this work. And thank you so much for presenting to our audience here today as part of a in the International Social Marketing Association's webinar series. I'm really, really happy to have had you here today. And I'll hand it back to Christine. Great. Thank you, Tamara. Thanks to our engaged participants with such excellent questions today. As we wrap up, we would really appreciate your feedback. Popping up on the screen are uh, three quick questions about the quality of today's webinar. We depend on your answers for development of future webinars. So please take one quick minute to share your feedback before you leave. I'd also like to share a quick reminder about ISMA's social marketing training courses. For those of you, uh, when we looked at the registration, there are a handful of you, this uh, was your first ISMA webinar. And that may mean that you are a new social marketer. So these are really fantastic social marketing training courses. Be sure to check those out, those details. We have a range of options from short courses to more in-depth coursework to self-paced that you can do at your pace, um, at your convenience. Don and Lindsay, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. And to our members and participants in today's webinar, thank you for your continued support and, and participation. We hope to see you at a future webinar. In the meantime, we encourage you to join ISMA and your regional association if you are not already a member. With your membership, you'll have access to our complete webinar archive and discounts on social marketing, professional development resources, and more. This is the Social Marketing Association and we now conclude today's webinar.